On behalf of the Louisiana Center for the Book in the State Library of Louisiana, thank you for joining us for this virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival presentation. This program is Carvel's Cure, Leprosy, Stigma, and the Fight for Justice with Pam Fessler and Marcia Godet. Pam Fessler was an award-winning editor and national correspondent with NPR News for more than 28 years. Most recently, she reported on poverty, inequality, and voting issues. Before that, Fessler covered the White House, politics, homeland security, and other national stories, including Hurricane Katrina and its aftermath. She was also NPR's Washington Desk Editor and Elections Editor. Fessler previously reported for Congressional Quarterly Magazine and for The Record Newspaper in Hackensack, New Jersey. This is her first book. Marcia Godet is Professor of English Emerita and a Lifetime Fellow for the Center of Louisiana Studies at University of Louisiana at Lafayette, where she was founding director of the Ernest J. Gaines Center. Her book, Carvel, Remembering Leprosy in America, was awarded the 2005 Chicago Folklore Prize. Her other books include Porch Talk with Ernest Gaines, This Louisiana Thing That Drives Me, The Legacy of Ernest J. Gaines, and Ernest J. Gaines' Conversations. Ladies and gentlemen, Pam Fessler and Marcia Godet. Hello, I'm Marcia Godet, and I'm here to talk with uh, Pam Fessler about her book. Uh, I'll put it up for you, Corvio's Cure, Leprosy, Stigma, and the Fight for Justice. This book is an immensely moving and beautifully written book starting with the story of a young American soldier in the Philippines in 1902, and going on to the story of Carville, which was for most of the 20th century, the only hospital in the continental United States for the treatment of Hansen's disease or leprosy. And of course, Carville is right here in Louisiana, not far from Baton Rouge. Pam Fessler is a former correspondent with NPR's National Desk, where she covered poverty, philanthropy, and voting issues, and actually just retired a few weeks ago. Corville's Cure is her first book. Pam, uh, would you start off just by describing the book and telling us how you came to write it? Um, thank you, Marcia, very much for that introduction. And I'm just so excited to be here and also to talk to you because, of course, yes. you do have written a book about um, Carville, which was wonderful and partly an inspiration for me thank when I was you. writing my book. Um, so you, a lot of people have asked me, you know, why did you write a book about leprosy, of all things? You know, I have no expertise or background in medicine or, or health care. And it's began as a personal story. And as a lot of stories, uh, it began with a family secret. And my father-in-law one day called us up in 1998. He was an elderly man. He was in his late seventies. And he said, I have to tell you something. Um, I've been keeping this secret for more than 60 years. When I was a young boy in New York, my, um, I went to school one day and this was in the 1930s. And when I came home, my father was gone. And the public health service had come and taken him away to some hospital in the South. He didn't know where. And he never saw his father again um, and didn't know where he had gone. He did know that his father had leprosy. But his mother said, don't ever tell anybody because the stigma for this disease was so great that she said it would ruin the family. And he had kept it inside for more than 60 years. But now as an older man, he said, I just, I, ha I, I have to tell you and I have to find out what happened to my father. So we started to do, my husband and I do some research and discovered that there was this hospital in Carville, Louisiana, run by the US government, where people who were diagnosed in this country with leprosy were brought and confined, many for 
the rest of their lives for decades um, because they had this disease. So we went down to, um, we, we, Carville still existed actually uh, at this time in 1998. So we took my father-in-law down to visit. And when we went down there, I, that's when I discovered that there was this extraordinary story. Not only was his family ripped apart, but hundreds and thousands of American families were ripped apart by this disease. And I, you know, I, I realized that this is a story that needed to be told, that many people did not realize that this institution exists. And one of the big things I discovered was that leprosy was among the least contagious and is among the least contagious diseases that there is. And 95% um, of humans can't contract the disease and the other 5% it's not easy to contract at all. So these people were isolated, ripped from their families more because of stigma and ignorance about this disease than for any real medical necessity. And I just wanna show real quickly, I'm just gonna show a couple of photos here. Um, let me just get this one. So this is my father-in-law as a young boy in New York. And this is his father who had leprosy, Morris Cole. And he's the one who was taken away. This was in 1935, he was taken away and he was brought to Carville. Um, and he died there three years later. My, as again, I say, my father-in-law never saw him. And um, this actually is another photo. Um, when we went down there, this photo was taken in the um, 19, late 1940s and early 1950s. And as you can see, it was a pretty big complex. Um, and it wasn't that different when we got there. Um, it's right along the Mississippi River, about 20 miles southeast of Baton Rouge. Um, and in what is pretty isolated area um, of, of Louisiana. Um, and it, it has quite the history. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as you point out, um, family secret, but in this case, a family secret that simply was going to, in some ways, define um, your father-in-law's relationship, you know, and his memories of his father. And in that picture, if, if I'm uh, f figuring this right, um, he had been diagnosed with leprosy for some time before that. Is that right? It's correct. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, leprosy, it's kind of interesting, is, is very, very, as I say, it's only mildly contagious, but it also is um, very, in many cases, very slow developing. Right. And so he got the disease, we believe we, that he contracted it when he was a young soldier in 1902 in the Philippines. Um, in the U he was serving in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Army. He was not diagnosed until 1922. That's when he first showed any um, symptoms. So that was a 20 year period. And um, he, was, he was not taken to Carville until 1935 when he had gotten really, really ill. He had actually become blind because the disease had affected his eyes. But, um, you know, it, it, as I say, it's a very slow developing disease. And, and one of the reasons it was so long before he was brought to Carville is because New York State was one of the few states that did not send patients to Carville who had leprosy. Almost every other state did. And he was diagnosed in Connecticut. And the doctor told him, which is where he lived at the time. And the doctor told him, I have to report you to the federal authorities and you're gonna be taken from your home and brought down to this hospital in Louisiana. Mm. But you have one option. If you go to New York, you won't have to do that. And he packed up his things that night and fled to New York, even though he had a family, a business, and three small children in Connecticut. And he brought them there um, two years later. Um, but, but that's how, how frightening this was and, wow. and, and our policy. And, you know, as, um, you know, as you're saying, your, your book, of course, um, some of these things, I mean, 
for many illnesses, you have the support um, and the help of those around you. But with this illness, you were pretty much on your own because you didn't want to let anyone else know. And um, you know, that move to New York basically allowed him to stay with his family. And, and again, uh, you talk about his, your father-in-law and uh, because of that move to New York, of course, his father stayed with him. So he got to know his father. He had memories of his father rather than having him leave when he was three years old, which then since he never saw him again would have meant that he would have had no memories of him. Exactly. Uh, but uh, also the, I thought we'd go back to what you said about the stigma and you know, how it affected not only the patients, but their families as well. And could you talk a little bit about the stigma of the disease? Right, and, and that's why, why um, you know, in Carville, this institution was even created in the first place. It started out um, as, as a, um, a state institution. It was mm -hmm. first the Louisiana Leper Home. It was in the late wow. 1800s. And there was just all this um, fear of disease in general um, because there were, that was when germ theory was starting to become more popularized and people were realizing that people could spread disease from one to the other with these things called germs. There was also a lot of anti-immigrant um, sentiment at the time and there was concern that immigrants were bringing in these exotic diseases. And so there was this groundswell uh, in Louisiana to do something with people who were diagnosed with leprosy because there was this fear that it was they didn't realize at the time that it was not that contagious. And so you have that combination of the ignorance with these prejudices against you know, people bringing in this disease. And the state decided to create something called the Louisiana Leper Home. Mm -hmm. And um, they wanted to create it in New Orleans where there were quite a few patients and there was also good medical care at the time but nobody in the city, every time they decided, oh, we're gonna build the hospital here, all the neighbors said, no, 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 we don't want this in our neighborhood. You know, We don't want these people around us. They're gonna spread the disease. It's gonna lower our property values. So the only place they could, the state could find was an abandoned plantation out, um, <laughs> as I say, along the Mississippi River. And, um, they snuck the patient, they had about um, seven patients at the time, they snuck them out in a barge from New Orleans in the middle of the night to this plantation because they didn't even want the people around the plantation to know the neighbors because they figured they would oppose it, uh, it as well. And let me just show you a real quick picture of what it looked like uh, when they um, first arrived, when the patients first arrived. Isn't that amazing? I mean, obviously it was not fit for anybody to live there. So the patients ended up, they ended up um, putting them in, there were some cabins in the back where the, the slaves at this plantation had lived. It was a sugar, an old sugar plantation. And the patients basically were, um, had to fend for themselves. I mean, and this was sort of the whole attitude towards people with leprosy at the time um, that, you know, we just want them out of here. We just want them away from us. We want them isolated. They pose a threat. Um, and then it wasn't until uh, the 1920s, the federal government actually ended up taking over. It, it got fixed up, obviously, mm -hmm. um, as you saw that other picture. But it, that it started then and, and, and it was built um, into a federal hospital in the 1920s and Congress passed legislation saying anybody, people who were diagnosed with leprosy should be isolated in this institution. Yeah, it's, um, and, and again, I think that so many ironies there that, um, you know, the, the, first of all, it is somewhat unusual, I think, for Louisiana to be sort of at the forefront of care for, you know, illness and a, a leader. And yes, the, the federal government did take over. Um, but 
it, I also think that one of the things you might talk about since you do discuss it in your book um, was the role of the Daughters of Charity and how you know, because it was so hard to get people to help there to take care of the patients. Um, tell us about their role. Yeah, and so when, you know, when, when the state of Louisiana created this um, hospital, um, they couldn't get anybody to go out and take care of the patients. And for, for, in fact, for, for the per first two years, they were basically on their own. So they finally were able to recruit the Daughters of Charity um, who were, they, they already had worked in a facility a charity hospital in, um, in New Orleans. So some of the sisters went out um, to Carville and became the nurses to, to care for the patients. And over the years, they not only provided the nursing care, they became um, therapists, they were um, the, the chief pharmacist, they did a lot of medical care, they were counselors for the patients. And when the federal government took over, same thing happened. They couldn't find anybody else who was willing to go to such an isolated area and to care for people with leprosy. I mean, there just was, you know, a lot of people were still afraid of the disease um, and they didn't want to go. So they actually ended up making the Daughters of Charity federal employees, public servants, and they continued to serve as nurses, um, and other medical um, professionals at the facility. And in fact, they continued to work there until 2005, right, uh, right when it was kind of, And th the other thing that's wonderful about the sisters is some of them became real advocates for the patients because over time, the patients, the people who worked there, it became obvious this disease is not that contagious because nobody who worked there contracted it. And they realized that they were unfairly being confined and isolated. I mean, there was a big fence around this facility. You were not allowed to leave for the most part. And they started, the patients started fighting for their rights and the sisters, the daughters of charity, some of them were right there in the, the, you know, at the forefront saying, you know, you need to fight for your rights. You should not be confined and isolated and lose your identity and your freedom and be taken away from your family just because you're sick. Yeah, and, and, and also we might point out that they not only lost um, you know, their identity or their freedom, they were encouraged to change their name to That's right. their family. And they lost the right to vote because there was no, the early times, uh, there, was, there was no voting precinct there. Um, and they did, of course, eventually, uh, after, again, much protest and advocacy on their part, um, again, got the right to vote. Right. And, and, and for me, as somebody who covered voting rights, you know, as a journalist, <laughs> that, that, that thing, that, that shocked me more than anything. And it was basically because there was a Louisiana state law that people who were um, uh, in institutions, certain right. institutions, including the, the leprosy hospital, were not allowed to vote. It was prisons and, and others, but also the leprosy hospital. And what happened is there turned out to be a number of patients who were veterans and they uh, they had uh, picked up the contracted the disease as my uh, father-in-law's father did um, he was in the Philippines in the Spanish American War others picked it up um, in other uh, while they were serving their country right and they go to Carva they are come back they contract this disease they get confined by their own government in this facility and then they can't vote and <laughs> The absurdity of that after World War II, there was a very high profile case of this oh, woman, um, Gertrude Hornbossel, who came and uh, she and her husband were basically, well, her husband was a war hero and they were outraged. You know, mm -hmm. her husband just could not believe that his wife 
was losing her right to vote. And he made a big case with the press, um, with the news media, and almost instantly in 1946, the state legislature changed that, that law. I mean, it was, it was sort of the final insult right. to the nations. Yeah, and, and I remember having grown up in Louisiana, a little bit closer to New Orleans than Carville, but voting there was um, something that they valued highly. In fact, the, usually there was 100% voting there, and so the poll was closed and the results were announced. <laughs> You know, I mean, that was the first precinct, yeah. right, right. <laughs> yeah, the first precinct that was always reported uh, right. in Louisiana. But that sort of determination, you know, to be involved in advocacy. And would you talk a little bit more about that and how the patients began to, uh, well, really became an advocacy group? And, and that to me is the most wonderful part of this story. So, you know, at the beginning, we, we, we see that, it, you know, this, very, this injustice really against these Americans. And I think over the course of uh, Carville's history, probably about 5,000, around 5,000 um, patients. But, you know, it was truly um, uh, unjust in, right. in many ways. And, and they were essentially imprisoned. But as I talk about in my book, and this to me is the most, it, 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 was, a, this, it was both a prison, but it was also a haven. So inside the walls of Carville, we're talking about this piece of property, 350 acres, big, beautiful grounds. Um, and, and they had lots, you know, there were, there were patients from all segments of, of the population. There were young people, there were old people, there were black patients, white patients, there were people who were highly educated. There were people who were very, very poor um, and illiterate. It, it was really a cross section of America, but they were a world unto themselves. And they had um, sporting activities and dances, and they even had Mardi Gras parades. I mean, it was an extraordinary world because inside the walls of Carville, they were accepted and they didn't have to bear the burden of the outside world where people look down upon them or, or consider them outcasts or ugly or, or repulsive. Inside Carville, they could create their own world. And that to me is the most wonderful part about this story. So there's this extraordinary community inside and the patients started basically to band together and to realize this injustice and that they needed to do something about it. And among the many activities that they had um, was a, a, a patient newspaper. And it was started by a patient named Stanley Stein who was a young man from Texas who was diagnosed with leprosy and he ended up getting taken to Carville. But he was very ambitious and smart and um, just, you know, a, a, a very driven person. And he started a newspaper there called The Star. And it was a patient newspaper. And it, you know, initially it was just you know, inpatient kind of things like, uh, you know, what was on the menu for Sunday night's dinner, what movie was, were they showing, um, you know, whose aunt came to visit, that type of thing. But eventually the patients started writing more articles about questioning the government policy, why they were being kept there, what was being done to try and find a cure for leprosy, of which there was not one, um, at least in the first half of the, the 20th century. Right. And this paper became an extraordinarily powerful advocacy tool because it was not only circulated inside Carville, the American Legion, local American Legion, kind of adopted the Carville cause and, because a lot of the patients were in fact veterans. So the American Legion started distributing this newspaper around the country and it start, they started having an impact and people started you know, other people from outside, including some big Hollywood stars, uh, people like Tallulah Bankhead, were like, this is an injustice, we need to do something about it. And it was all because of the patients. And it's, I think, the first patient advocacy movement, uh, yes. you know, of our time. And it's a, it's a wonderful story of human resilience, what people right. do when faced with, you know, just really, you know, terrible odds, 
they'd basically been abandoned by society. And sometimes by their own families. And exactly, exactly. Some people's families just, they, they went to Carvel, they were diagnosed, the family completely disowned them. They didn't see spouse. So, and this is only some of the families. You know, some of the families, the spouses never came to see them. They never saw their children again. Um, you know, they, they, as you say, they were asked to change their names um, to, to basically kind of sever ties. Uh, with the and as you point out in the book, uh, if, uh, one patient who says that, you know, her father dropped her off um, and then went home and told even her siblings that she had died. Right. And, and she was a young girl at the time. She, she was, was a young girl. Yeah. And she didn't know, she didn't even know that she had leprosy. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was, it was so sad. And, and, you know, you, you can see why people might have been terrified in some ways because they didn't right. know. And there was so much mythology and, and misinformation out there about this right. disease. And, um, and, and also since, um, just to get, put it into perspective, um, we might talk about um, you know, susceptibility to the disease and you know, this, what, well, they've known actually for quite some time, for over 50 years now, um, over 70 years really, about the probability and uh, susceptibility to the, to the disease. Right, and, and as I say, you know, only about 5% of mm -hmm. the population uh, is, is believed to be susceptible. But so what you had, there were a lot of cases where um, families would have quite a few people within the same uh, family who would get the disease because obviously they have, you know, the same genetic makeup or similar genetic makeup and they're living in close quarters. So there were a number of cases, especially in, um, in Louisiana, um, yeah. where, where it was already a little bit more dominant uh, or prevalent disease. Um, there's one uh, story that I talk about in the, in the book called of the Landry family, where from Lafayette, where they, all five siblings, ended up in Carvel over a period of 60 years. And I think that fed this belief that it was a highly contagious disease um, because people say, oh, well, you know, he has the disease and now his brother has the disease. So, so that if a family was identified as having anybody who had the disease, they were, um, um, you know, really shunned. Ostracized. And as you know, I mean, some places people's houses were burned down right. because there was this belief we've got to kill this germ. Um, and a lot of it, I think, goes back to the Bible, you know, that there was, we, we have this, um, you know, mythology that's gone, you know, through, through, through centuries that this is a disease that, um, in some ways is a reflection of somebody's moral, um, that this is God punishing somebody for some kind of moral failure. Uh, even though uh, scholars now think that the disease that's described in the Bible that we call leprosy actually was something else and not what we call yes. leprosy or yeah. today we call it Hansen's disease. And, um, but it's still, you know, that permeated the culture. It, and I, quite frankly, continues to permeate it today to some right. extent. Right. And, um, Oh, I was just going to say it was well, one of the things that I real I, I didn't realize until I did research in this book is is that the book Ben Hur I always thought Ben Hur was just a movie, but it was a book that was written right after the Civil War. It was second only to the Bible in um, in popularity. Right, and in that book, Ben Hur's mother and sister contract leprosy they are and he, they're, they're described as their skin falling off I mean it's just awful and they're banned from Jerusalem and they have to you know Christ has to cure them um, you know for them to come back and, and this really permeated the culture right and um, I, I think too that you know we've talked about the fact that um, without some accurate information about it then people 
are influenced by what they've heard from other sources like the Bible or movies or, I mean, the word leprosy and um, of course, as you don't use in your book, except when you're quoting, especially the word leper, um, it, it, it's really those patients consider it a slur because right. you know it has such an emotional load. I mean, to be it, it's used as as I think you pointed out um, one time before um, that uh, you know even very respectable places like NPR will use it, you know, to, to make that point about someone who is ostracized. Right. And there was, that was actually, you know, when, when I was looking to see, you know, right. how, an example, when I went in my book and I looked, you know, just Googled the word leper to see <laughs> what it was used recently. I was like, oh my goodness, it was um, some appearance. It was a guest who was appearing on uh, NPR and they were, um, talking about, it was some small business thing and they were calling you know, somebody a leper of the industry, uh, meaning that nobody wanted anything to do with them. And that word is used constantly. If you look that word up in the dictionary, right. the first definition is not somebody who has Hansen's disease. The first wow. definition is outcast or pariah. And one of the things that the patients, Stanley Stein especially, tried to do was to get people including advertisers, um, academics, to not use the word leper or leprosy to describe their right. disease, but to in fact call it Hansen's disease, which is named after the doctor in um, Norway who discovered uh, the germ that caused um, the disease. Yeah. They, you know, they had some success, but you know, still today, yeah. you know. And, and um, yeah, I think, I every other disease, you become a patient or, you know, someone who has a disease, but, you know, with this, with Hansen's disease, you become something different or traditionally. And one of the, the strong advocacies of the group was to get people to understand that this disease is no different from any other bacterial disease. And in fact, is less contagious. Yes, <laughs> it's actually yeah. quite, it's less of a threat to the public at large than many, many, many other diseases. And I, ironically, a lot of people who went to Carville, you know, it was a very, especially in the early uh, part, it is very kind of swampy area, hot, mosquito infested. Many more people died of malaria, tuberculosis. Right. They died of everything except leprosy. Um, right. which is the great irony. And one of the things I discovered um, when I was doing research for my book is that when my father-in-law's father went there, Morris Cole, he went there, shortly after he went there, there was a huge malarial outbreak that affected, right. mm -hmm. I, I believe about a third of the population of Carville. And I think about half of them died within a couple of years. He was one of those people who got mm -hmm. malaria. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I wonder if he had not been sent there, if he would have lived longer. Yeah, it's certainly possible. And I, I don't think you've, we've talked about that yet, but the fact that no worker at Carville ever contracted the disease. Exactly. And, you know, they had tours, you know, there were visitors. And we might also point out that not since COVID uh, epidemic because the museum is not open for tours right now, but the museum that's still at the Corville facility um, that sort of gives you the history of the place, um, you know, you can still go there and see this, but there were always tours and patients very early could have leave, they could, you know, leave to go home for a funeral, or they could, and again, that reminds me very much of the prison mindset, which is just an awful thing. Right. And in fact, they were sometimes taken with shackles, you know, so that, so they would escape. And yet, fairly soon after that, they had two weeks leave a year. So there was actually a very bizarre kind of quarantine. 
Right. And there was a, there was a lot of contradiction going yes. on. You know, there were people who, um, you know, they, they, they sent their family relative or their, their doctor sent the person to Carvel. And then they realized, well, maybe this isn't so good. They're not going to get it better. And then they, they snuck them out. You know, right. they helped them escape. Right. And so at one point they think that they're, they're a real threat and contagious. And then all of a sudden they're thinking, oh my gosh, this is so unjust. We have to help them escape. And there was something um, they called everybody, all the patients called it the hole in the fence. And it was a, um, a section of the fence away from, there was a, actually a guard booth at the, at the entrance um, to the grounds, but way to one side, there was a part of this huge fence that surrounded the ground some you know for many years topped with barbed wire where the patients had lifted up from the ground uh, the bottom of the fence and so people could sneak um, out and a lot of patients some patients tried to escape permanently uh, some people fell in love at Carville they were like young men and women and that they did what young men and women do everywhere and they fell in love and some of them wanted to get married and they, and they couldn't get married. They couldn't even really uh, be together very much um, at Carville and they snuck out. Some of them snuck out to get married. Um, some people would sneak out just to go to a bar down the street, <laughs> have some drinks <laughs> and then come back in again. And to me, one of the interesting things is a lot of people who did leave Carville ended up coming back voluntarily. And they came back because the world outside was not so nice to them. And so inside, again, they had this, this haven, this community where they were accepted um, for who they were. And so, there, as I say, there were all these contradictions. We're a prisoner, but we also wanna be here because we feel here that we're accepted. Um, you know, I kind of wanted to show a few of the photos because, you know, I, it wasn't all, um, you know, awful. It, it, it sounds like it's this terrible place, but, you know, it, it, in many ways, it was a thriving community. And I just have a few photos I wanted to just show of some of the, the life there. Um, here we go. I mean, they had uh, bands. They had lots of music. They did plays, the patients. Um, there were dances. I love this picture because it could be a dance anywhere in America, right? Um, well, it, at that time, it, it could have been a dance anywhere in America, but not necessarily in the South, because as yeah. you noted, that, that's an integrated dance. And at the time that picture was taken, that wouldn't have been at any other place in the South, which is right. really remarkable. In fact, the school, because there were children who were patients, the school was the only school in the Deep South that was integrated. Yeah, it, it was it was extraordinary. Right. And I believe, and actually I'll show a couple more pictures too. I, I actually feel like it was this kind of diversity of this community that gave it some of its strength to go out and fight. You know, these patients, you know, they, they, what they shared was they were discriminated by the outside world because of their disease. Right. So you had these patients who were, as you say, you know, they're black patients, white patients, Asian patients, you know, they, they, they were bound together by this shared discrimination. And some of these patients were shocked when they left. Some of them had come as children and they were shocked right. when they left to find out, oh my goodness, <laughs> it was a lot of discrimination out there. This is another one of my favorite. Again, yeah. <laughs> ratio group. These are kids playing, um, and then oh, and they had the Mardi Gras. That was another big event every year for obvious reasons. And um, this is one of my favorite ones because <laughs> another picture of this integrated group. I mean, you can see there, and this is a bar in the Deep South in the late '40s. And you have black um, patients, white patients, Asian patients, um, Hispanic patients, and there they all are having a great time. I mean, it, it was an extraordinary community. It's Santa Claus and the Coca-Cola sign in the back. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And um, I, I don't think we've talked very much about that, but uh, we might also mention to people that you know that. From uh, uh, the 1940s, there were very 
effective treatments. And that Corville played a huge role in discovering a cure. And it's now uh, just considered a curable disease. And in fact, it's cured very quickly. And right. that's of course the reason why Corville Hospital, which was actually a military base, a Marine base, was closed in 1999. Although the Kansas Disease Center for research and some of the older patients were treated there, uh, moved to Baton Rouge. Um, right. But basically, you know, it is a curable disease if it's diagnosed. Right. With and, and, yeah, and that was sort of one of the amazing, uh, other amazing things about, about Carville, because these patients were confined, they were very um, eager to, for, the, for the government to find a cure and for doctors to find a cure. So you had these doctors there, there was a, um, you know, there was a lab, there was a hospital there and the patients, and there was a lot of testing of all different kinds of potential cures. And it was there at Carville after many, many, many efforts of trying a million different things that one wow. of the doctors said, I'm gonna try this thing called the sulfone drugs, which um, had been used to try and treat tuberculosis, not very effectively. Um, but he said, well, let's try it and see if it works on patients uh, who have leprosy. And lo and behold, it did. Yeah. I mean, it was a, a slowly evolving process. They had to kind of come up with the right combination of drugs. It, 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 it worked better for some patients than others, but it was the discovery of the beginning of the drug that we use today, a combination of drugs that we are used today in this world to treat yeah. leprosy. Um, and of which there are still 200,000 new cases every year. Uh, that are diagnosed yeah. around the world of this disease. So it's not done. Yeah, I mean, far fewer in the US, about 200 a year in, in the US, but still for those patients, uh, you know, the fact that it's curable if they're diagnosed, not many doctors, uh, you know, uh, eventually they are, and I think there's more knowledge. Uh, but uh, again, um, you know, someone has to be diagnosed before because they will and they can be treated they're treated at outpatient clinics they exactly. don't have to come to which is what patients were arguing should be done you know yeah. 50 right. 60 years ago yeah. and i think the interesting thing is you know we we have the medication to cure people we know how to, to do if they're if people are diagnosed but still around the world many people will not seek treatment right. or diagnosis because the stigma still exists and they don't want to be scorned by their families right. or societies or so it's the stigma that still today is one of the more damaging um, aspects of this disease yes and certainly um you know it's something that still in many in some parts of the world you know can cause just someone's life to be destroyed and in fact the whole families and I, I want to get back to your own connection and your family because I think that's a powerful story of how your own family's story your husband's family's story is interconnected with the Corville story and so would you tell us about the first time your family and you and your husband and your father-in-law visited Carville. Yeah, so we brought him down. I, as I mentioned, he was about 78 years old at the time. Carville at the at that time in 1998, there were still some patients who lived there. They they of course at that point were allowed to go. You know, they were no longer yeah. confined. But there were many patients who had spent most of their lives there. They had nowhere else to go. This was their home. So the government basically cared for them for the rest of their lives. I had agreed to care for them for the rest of their lives if they wanted. Um, it was like a, basically a nursing home. So we went down there, we, uh, we saw these incredible grounds. Um, it was a very emotional visit for my father-in-law and the public health ser um, service uh, social worker who was there at the time had tracked down my father-in-law's father's gravesite, which was in a very small cemetery in Baton Rouge. 
and she had found it and she drove us there and we walked with my father-in-law to a far, far corner of this little cemetery and sort of tucked in the corner right against the fence was this little gravestone that was for his father. And it, it was almost like he was isolated mm -hmm. intentionally because he had come as a leprosy patient. So even in death, I, I feel like these leprosy patients were um, discriminated against. And I, I say it was probably one of the most emotional moments of my life to watch this man at 78 finally see where his father had ended up. And, 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 and then to realize that this had happened to so many other families. I mean, it affected his entire life. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And the sort of not knowing, never having been there, I'm sure, again, in that, that need to honor his mother's wish that he keep the secret. Yeah. And of course, as you write in your book, uh, eventually his remains were moved. And would you also just briefly tell us about that? Yeah, I just, um, you know, over, over the years as a reporter, I have done a lot of reporting down in Louisiana and I would go visit the cemetery in Baton Rouge just to go visit the grave site. And over the years, I noticed it was starting to, you know, get overgrown and deteriorated and there was garbage and trash. And I don't know, it just seemed, especially for a veteran, it just seemed very, disrespectful and, and kind of a, another insult to this man's life. And so um, we decided to see if he could have his remains um, removed, um, moved to Arlington Cemetery. And through much work and much paperwork, my husband was finally able to have that done. And we um, had his remains cremated and um, brought up to um, Arlington. And we had, he had a full military, um, uh, ceremony up there. And it was really sort of a fitting end to here was a man like other veterans who had contracted this disease while in the service of his country. We believe he contracted it in the Philippines during the Spanish American War, but then was imprisoned by his and taken from his family by his own country because he had this disease. And this kind of pulled it back full circle. And the head of the honor guard, you know, when he sat down or knelt down in front of my husband with the flag, the American flag at the service, and gave it to my husband and said, you know, on behalf of a grateful nation, we are honoring Morris Cole for his service to the country. And it was just, you know, it was like, <laughs> emotional. Emotional. Yeah. Yeah. It was incredibly emotional. And I say, like, you know, there are so many more stories in this book that are even more emotional than that, you know, that this, you know, as my husband says, I can't believe my grandfather's story is one of the smaller stories in the book because they're, it's extraordinary example of how we can be um, sort of mean to people, considering them other, but that human beings can be so resilient and fight against this and fight for the right. So it, it, it I, I think it's just a wonderful story. Yeah, it is. And I know our time is getting near, but before we end, um, of course, Hansen's disease, leprosy, uh, patients were affected so terribly by misinformation and stigma. And we see some of this, of course, happening with the COVID epidemic. Um, would you just sort of compare that and sort of what do you think we can learn uh, from leprosy as we're dealing with the whole COVID? Situation? Well, I think one of one of the big parallels that I noticed is just how we have often we use disease we did during leprosy and we have during COVID in in some ways as a, as a political weapon um, or to also to demonize the victims in some right. ways. That mm -hmm. somehow they are responsible for this disease, uh, even though they're not. And um, there was a lot of prejudice in um, around the turn of the century about people with leprosy. And there was a lot of anti-Asian, anti-immigrant 
prejudice, feeling like they were causing this disease. And of course, we saw that again with COVID, that people turning around blaming um, Asian Americans as so somehow they were responsible for this, you know, this uh, infectious disease to come to the United States. And I think part of the problem is when there is a lack of information, a lack of good scientific knowledge or just ignorance, it, it leaves open the way for people to use their own prejudices and to kind of do what they think should be done in terms of this disease. So you, we now have, you know, oh, I'm not gonna wear a mask because nobody really knows how this disease is spread. Right. And, and a part of it is just, you know, ignorance. And, and I think it shows again, how much leaders, public health officials, government leaders, what a responsibility they have and the experts sort of have to say, okay, this is what we do know. There might be certain things we don't know, but this is what we know. And this is what the best thing is for people to do to try and contain this illness. Um, and I guess the last quick thing is that, you know, that all these public health decisions that are made they don't just affect the patient, they affect their families, they affect the community, wow. they, 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 they can affect people over generations and that, that puts a lot of responsibility on us as a society to make sure we are making the right decisions when dealing with disease. Yeah. But certainly don't blame the victim, don't blame that poor patient. Yeah. And, and, and basically don't blame immigrants unless we, as in the case of leprosy, we're all immigrants because you know it occurred all over the world. We know it was in Nova Scotia, and we know that you know that Norway, everywhere, everywhere, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so sort of very interesting that um, almost no cases have been dis of leprosy have been diagnosed in Native Americans, and. Mm -hmm. You know, but un unless we understand we're a country of immigrants, it was definitely not an immigrant disease. Um, Pam, thank you so much. And for everyone listening, this is a powerful story, disease, stigma, and especially of resilience and hope. And thank you, Pam. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you for watching this presentation of the virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival. Please visit our official bookseller, Cavalier House Books, and receive 20% off all featured festival titles through the end of the year. A special thank you to our festival sponsors. The Louisiana Book Festival will return on October 29th, 2022.